Namaste. So in the previous shloka, the objective was given to keep the mind in the state of inactivity or peacefulness, non-identification, pure consciousness, without an object, without looking out for anything, without trying to do anything. In other words, the state of Brahman. Now, in this shloka, the means is given, the method is given. And in this work, it's called Asparsha Yoga. We'll explain that after going through the shloka and commentary. Layo sangbodha yech chittang vikshiptang shamayet punaha sakashyang vijaniyat samapraptang nachalayet. If the mind becomes inactive in a state of oblivion, awaken it again. If it is distracted, bring it back to the state of tranquility. In the intermediary state, know the mind containing within it desires in potential form. If the mind has attained to the state of equilibrium, then do not disturb it again. When the mind is immersed in oblivion, samadhi or sushupti, then arouse it by means of knowledge and detachment. That is to say, turn the mind to the exercise of discrimination, leading to knowledge of the self. The word chitta in the text means manas or mind. If the mind is distracted by various objects of desire, bring it back to the state of tranquility. When, by constant practice, the mind is thus awakened from the state of inactivity and also turned back from all objects, but not yet established in equilibrium, when the mind dwells in an intermediary state, then know the mind to be possessed of attachment. It still contains seeds of desires for enjoyment and inactivity. With great care, bring the mind from that state to the realization of equilibrium. Once the mind has realized the state of equilibrium, or when it is on the way to realize that state, then do not disturb it again. In other words, do not turn it to external objects by attachment. So this is the method. This is the means. This is the way to practice to attain jnana, self-realization, knowledge that I am Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi, and that Brahman is everything, Sarva Kalvidam Brahma. So, in other words, yoga, in the highest sense, is not about sitting in a certain posture, although postures may be uh, helpful in the beginning of the practice, simply to help concentrate the mind. For example, in the beginning, one may go to a secluded place in the forest next to a river or lake, away from people, outside of civilization, away from all disturbance. This is very good. But understand that the silence or the equanimity or the tranquility that you achieve in that setting is only borrowed. In other words, it's already present in the environment. And when you come back into town, when you see your old buddies again, <laughs> or when you again enter your typical house, family situation, or whatever, you again become subject to attachment and the mind becomes disturbed, isn't it? So the real goal of practice, even though it may require some special conditions in the beginning, is to be able to live in the midst of everything 
in ordinary environment without any special arrangements and still maintain detachment. Detachment simply means one does not identify with any sense objects. That's it. It doesn't mean that you sit in a cave in some special yoga posture or that you breathe according to a certain number of heartbeats or that you recite some mantra 24 hours a day or that you do some puja or some special mental exercise. These are all helpful at certain stages. But now we're talking about the very last stage, the end of the path the topmost yoga process. That doesn't mean that you're qualified to do it. Yeah, sure, try it. And if it seems insurmountably difficult, then drop it for now and go back to what worked for you in the past. Make that strong and bring it up to the standard and then gradually move on to the higher practice. See, this is the way the path actually works. Now, most teachers concentrate on only one special method, path, mantra, deity, or whatever. But we are trying to show the whole path because we want to help everybody. And what that means is you have to understand the structure of the path and the four stages of consciousness, which we've gone over a million times. Here's the chart again. When you are in Jagrat consciousness, which is objectivized externality, uh, extroverted identification, <laughs> and seeing that the body and the senses, and the mind and the world are real, you have to do karma yoga. Why? So that you amass enough merit, enough subhakama, or good karma, so that the next stage comes. And the next stage is love of God, bhakti. And in this, you will master the uh, svapna consciousness, dreaming. So bhakti yoga is of essence a beautiful dream, a dream about God. Now, of course, God is real. As long as the world is real to you, God is also real to you because you have to explain how the world exists and how it's operating. Obviously, there's some intelligence behind it. Otherwise, how could it even exist? What to speak of operate in such a finely balanced and complex system. Anytime we see something like a computer, I mean, even the phone, you know, that I'm taking this video on. Anytime we see something wonderful like this, it means there's intelligence behind it. Without intelligence, it doesn't come into being. Uh, before human beings roamed this earth, there were dinosaurs and other animals for millions and billions of years. They never invented smartphones. So in other words, the intelligence to invent something grand and wonderful has to come from a human level or above. And in the machinery, the system of the world, we see evidence of extremely advanced intelligence. I mean, the more you study natural science, I don't know how scientists can be atheists because the more you penetrate into the intricate mechanism of this world, the more you see that intelligence and more than that, consciousness has to be behind it. So anyway, God is inconceivable. That intelligence is so much beyond ours, we can't even embrace it. We can't even imagine it. So we create symbols like the different gods, different forms of God, different names of God and different aspects of God that are worshipped in religion 
in, by bhakti. And this develops love for God. And don't think God is not watching. Don't think God is unaware. No, he, she, or whatever it is. <laughs> you know, our anthropomorphic symbols can't really describe it, but it does give a terminal for communication. That's what a deity is. That's what a temple is. That's what a mantra is. So practicing bhakti brings us to the stage of spontaneous meditation, spontaneous concentration, if bhakti is practiced very well, reaching the spontaneous stage, the original stage where one develops a unique personal relationship with God through any one of the symbols, identities, but then beyond that is Raja Yoga, where all symbols and identities are cast off, where all names and forms are nullified, and where one comes face to face with the void, emptiness, nothingness. This is a very high stage, but it's not the highest stage because after that, there's Jnana, and that's what we're talking about in this series, Jnana Yoga, and particularly Sparsha Yoga. Sparsha means unrelated, that Brahman is not related to anything because on the platform of Brahman, there isn't anything else for it to be related to. <laughs> so when one collects the mind and brings it into a state of tranquility unrelated to anything else. That is Sparsha Yoga. That is the highest and purest form of Jnana. Jnana is sometimes mistranslated as knowledge and that leads some people to have the opinion that simply knowing about, for example, the oneness of everything is the same as realizing it, but it's not. The actual realization is a state of tranquility. So now to get back to where we started in the beginning, <laughs> you may go to some ashram or hermitage or cave or forest or other peaceful place, or, or simply just lock the door in your room. Uh, and, you know, educate the people around you that when you are in your room, you are not to be disturbed. And practice. And this practice could be as simple as zazen, sitting in front of a wall, doing nothing, thinking nothing. Or it could be more complex. It could be like uh, Shankaracharya describes in this purport, in this commentary that one watches the mind and when the mind tries to move out through the senses, gradually, gently bring it back into that state of tranquility, non-attachment, non-identification. Identification means I am this, I am that. I am so-and-so, I am such-and-such. So. -and -such. so to get beyond this identification, one goes through the state of neti neti in meditation. It's not this, it's not that, it's nothing. And finally, when that state becomes stabilized, one can move out of the cave or the ashram or, you know, wherever you've got yourself secluded and engage with the world without losing that state. This is the highest. This is what we see, for example, in Ramana Maharshi and great personalities like that. That they are never deluded. They are never identified. They don't think they are the body or the senses or the mind. What to speak of various objects and designations and names and forms in the material world. So a person who has realized this will not say, I am a guru, or I am enlightened, or I am anything. <laughs> because he knows it's not true. It's just another identification. 
Well, what he doesn't say is much more profound than what he does say. Because by not identifying with anything, he simply slips through the world like, like a stealth plane, you know? <laughs> he doesn't get into anybody's radar. He stays out of range, even though he may be in the middle of everything. And this is easy life. This is happy life. Everybody likes someone who is unattached because they're always happy. They're never angry. They're never trying to force something on somebody else. They're never on a trip, you know? <laughs> they're always just themselves. And that's really the highest state of enlightenment. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Nam Shivai. <laughs>